How's it going everybody? Welcome back to your favorite Satoshi Club channel where today I'm going to give you a little lesson in economics. So what is a supply shock? And I'm going to tie that into, you know, what is a demand shock as well? I'm going to explain a few charts so you can understand the basic economics behind this and so you can understand how potential supply shocks in the future are going to influence both the uh, you know, the market, so the stock market, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies in general, since this is the Satoshi Club, but also at the same time, how it is going to influence the economy, right, on a global level. So it's a pretty interesting video. And if you enjoy it, make sure to drop a like, but I'm not going to, you know, hassle you with all this uh, introductory stuff anymore. Let's just get into it. And before I actually explain what supply shocks are and what caused them, I'm going to show you a few charts that I like to talk about. So one of the charts is the short run aggregate supply curve chart. And this may look complicated for you at the start, but it's very, very simple. In fact, you have the aggregate demand in the economy, which is the sum of every single demand in every single sector out there. So I have a demand for goods and services, right? Some of the goods that I demand that are very uh, inelastic for me are water and food, right? Water and food, I'm always going to have to buy. So I have a demand for that. Other people in the economy may have demand for cars and, uh, you know, trucks, trains, uh, airplane tickets, anything that's in the economy that's a product or service goes into the aggregate demand curve. And the aggregate demand curve, how it's actually uh, construed is it's downward sloping because as the price of a product increases, the demand for the product increases. So uh, sorry, the, as the price increases, the demand decreases. So that is why price is on right here and the demand is actually right here or the supply on an aggregate level. And as you can see, as price increases, as we're moving left on the chart, the demand level actually uh, decreases. So if that makes sense for now, let's move on to the supply side. So on the supply side, the supply is the sum or the aggregate sum of every single supply in the economy. So that could be supply of wheat, supply of food, supply of water, supply of absolutely everything. And supply can be messed around with by natural disasters, by economic events, by geopolitical news and events. And this can cause shifts in the supply curve. So now that you understand how the supply curve is formed, which is the sum of all supplies in the economy. And obviously, as the price is lower, right, the supply will be lower because suppliers won't be willing to supply a product at a low price. But as price of the product increases, the supply of these products also increases as well because suppliers can make more money. Hence why the supply curve is upward sloping. So what we can see right here is an example of a positive supply shock. So what happened right here is that the supply curve or the short run aggregate supply, as economists like to call it, actually shifted towards the right. And what does that mean? It means that there was a shock in supply, but it's a positive shock. Why? Because the price actually decreased on an aggregate level. So as you can see, price was at this level right here. Now it is at this level right here and the demand actually increased. So as a result of, for example, a subsidy from the economy that we're in. So if the government subsidizes, for example, agriculture and allows them to produce at a slightly lower price, that would be an aggregate supply shock where the supply would actually increase and the quantity demanded would increase as a result and the price would decrease, right? But on the other hand, we have a shift to uh, the left of the supply curve, which would be a negative supply shock, which would be, for example, if, uh, you know, there's like a natural disaster or a tsunami or a hurricane or something that wipes out a lot of crops. And at that point, supply would decrease. And as the supply decreases, the price is naturally going to increase and quantity demanded is going to decrease, right? Why? Well, simply because as the price, the price was right here. So this is the equilibrium and the price actually increased as a result of the short run aggregate supply curve shifting to the left. And what happens here is basically that the uh, economy is now uh, operating at a higher price level and the demand is also uh, lower. So why is this happening? Well, suppliers have to charge a larger price because they have less supply of their goods because the hurricane wiped everything out. And as a result of the higher price, there is now lower demand. And that's pretty much how everything works in the economy. So let's tie this in with uh, Investopedia's 
description here of supply and demand where supply shocks are the changes of supply of a product or commodity now it's unforeseen usually it's very abrupt and it's results uh, you know in a decreased supply in the negative case and a positive in the positive case it yields an increased supply if it's a decreased supply in the negative case that means that the price will actually increase which will be bad for consumers but uh, on the other hand if it's a positive supply shock and the price is now, you know, decrease is going to be good for consumers because the price is cheaper. Now, key takeaways, we have the changes of supply of a product or commodity. A positive supply shock increases output, causing prices to decrease. Negative supply shock decreases output, causing prices to increase. And they're usually caused by unforeseen events. Now, one simple example, and there is going to be a larger example that I'm going to discuss, which is the COVID pandemic itself. But one simple example is crude oil, right? It's a commodity that's considered very vulnerable to negative supply shocks due to the political and social volatility of the Middle Eastern source of, you know, suppliers of oil. And then every time something happens over there, it can cause either a positive or negative supply shock. So understanding supply shock itself, I think I've explained it pretty nicely, but if you didn't understand, make sure to comment down below. But if you did, drop a like and subscribe to the channel so you can see more content like this and follow all the Satoshi socials in the description below. But let's see some examples of a supply shock itself. First and foremost, we have a positive supply shock for competing firms, right? Where Glencore announced in September 2015, its plans to close two major copper mines in Africa, removing 400,000 tons of copper from the global output. So what happens when you remove 400,000 tons of anything from the supply chain? That means there is now less supply, which means that the price is going to increase just like we applied on this chart. And when there's less supply and the price increases, this is something that suppliers can benefit from. But uh, people who are actually buying it do not benefit from it because the price is now larger. And what happened? Well, these guys actually did it and made the decision because there was a prolonged slump in copper prices. So copper prices were moving down and they said, OK, we're going to cut the supply a little bit, create a supply shock so that the price is restored back to equilibrium once again, where, you know, competing firms can have some sort of a, uh, you know, better price when it comes to supplying copper. So that's one of the positive you know, supply shocks. And when it comes to the negative ones, well, for example, it also could be as a result of a change in demand, right? So here's what happened with Chinese demand um, when it comes to these copper prices as well. So for the previous decade, demand for copper from China was around 10% until it fell to three to 4% in 2015. So this is also the same pretty much case, but the drop in copper prices actually uh, highlights how concentrated a change in demand can actually influence uh, all of these prices. So a change in demand actually has to be abrupt and perceived as temporary to qualify as a shock, as in this case on the supply side. So if demand falls very rapidly at some point, it can actually be construed as a supply shock as well at the same time. So this whole situation uh, started off with a demand shock, which is also a factor in economics, which uh, would basically on this chart mean that the, the aggregate demand curve is actually moving left to right. And let me just quickly explain that as well. If we have the aggregate demand curve moving, shifting towards the left or right, it could be as a result of, for example, um, you know, competitor, uh, if you're purchasing beer, right, in the store, right? And that's the product that you're purchasing from. And now we're talking, not talking about aggregate demand, we're talking about simple demand for, for beer. Your demand for beer is probably going to increase if the price of peanuts, a product that is a comp, uh, how, how do you call that again? It's not a substitute. That's a complement, right? So if the price of peanuts decreases, you're probably going to end up buying more beer because you need to wash down those peanuts with something. So your demand curve is going to shift to the right because you're going to demand more, right? Because a price of a competitive or sorry, a uh, complementary product decrease. Now, at the same time, if it happens that the price of beer simply decreases, then that's not going to be a shift in the aggregate or demand curve. It's simply going to be a movement along the demand curve. So actually influencing, uh, you know, from the supply side. Now, let's move back into this article and see lastly, what kind of events cause these supply shocks. So we have that technological breakthroughs can also be a culprit, such as in 1973, when the oil embargo organized by OPEC in response to this war was actually released, where it drastically changed the price of oil in that time. We also have COVID-19 that caused both supply and demand shocks, which is my next uh, next case right now that I wanted to show you. Now, first of all, I do have this World Bank document open up here. It's 40 pages of big knowledge, but it's very difficult and probably 
Uh, I'm still gonna leave a link down below because it does have something to do with COVID, uh, with supply shocks, with demand shocks, how this all influenced the world economy, but I'm not gonna bore you with it to death right now. I'm just gonna leave, you, leave it in the description for those of you that are interested in something like this. But let's move into a little article talking about is COVID, right, the pandemic, a supply or demand shock? Now, first of all, foremost, what we need to know is that social distancing, right, uh, it actually shut down entire sectors of the economy. And most mostly right the people that suffer the most are leisure and uh, hospitality businesses so restaurants or anywhere where you couldn't actually enter and sit down because of social distancing lockdowns and all of this other stuff for example other things such as zoom such as you know online calls such as people who work remotely and anything that could be done from the computer actually kept its its level right even though a lot of these other sectors actually pretty much uh, went uh, went crazy right so a lot of workers were left jobless a lot of stay-at-home orders were actually implemented and consumers also decreased their use of services so what happens from the supply side right a lot of people get fired because there's not a lot of supply or for jobs right for labor a lot of people get fired and then these people that are fired which is first of all a supply shock then they don't have enough money to purchase stuff in the local grocery store which is a demand shock because right now everyone's demand level fell why do they demand less well because they're making less money and this is a downward spiral or a deflationary spiral with which had to be somehow uh, you know played with which uh, which basically happened by uh, you know this enormous uh, printing of money by the fed to cause uh, you know stimulus checks to do all of this stuff to turn this potentially deflationary situation which would be absolutely horrible for the world economy into an inflationary situation which even though it's pretty bad um and we are probably going to feel the repercussions of it in the following years it is still probably better than a deflationary situation so furthermore you know conventionary monetary and fiscal policy can offset some of these aggregate demand shocks but not all of them right and sometimes you need to see is it better to incorporate demand policies or supply policies right supply side or demand side and this is the whole point of this little article right here where they use data on us hours worked and real wages to estimate labor demand and supply shocks for the aggregate economy and for different sectors so the reason why i'm showing you this is because you know you probably should have a look at a chart like this here and there because it is pretty interesting and representative of what was actually happening on the economic side in the us during the time of COVID. So what we can see right here is demand, which is in blue, and supply, which is in red. And we see negative percentage points right here. So how growth hours worked by sector were influenced due to the COVID pandemic. So first of all, we have top uh, total private employment, right? Two thirds of total private employment was influenced from the supply side because companies didn't have money to keep their employees in business and just fire them. One third was by uh, the demand side right why well because you know people didn't have enough money and were scared to use these services that top private employment firms actually provide and then from the demand side uh, you know they saw a drop in demand but also you know the drop was actually larger from the supply side we see the same for mining and lodging where it was mostly supply side right construction for example didn't really see much of a demand shock the demand shock for construction was actually positive right slightly positive whereas the supply side for construction was negative so you could say that there was less supply than there was demand for construction right more so on the negative side now we have manufacturing where also supply dominates we have uh, wholesale trading which is pretty much the same and almost uh, untapped at all by covid uh, we have retail and all of these are you know you know they're chilling right utilities information financial activities but we have first of all education and health services where it most was mostly influenced from the supply side but then we have leisure and hospitality this sector absolutely went crazy right for covid because as we can see most of it was from the supply side and it was a six percent uh you know from the supply side and a total almost 10 percentage points uh, in the negative when it comes to everything when it comes to you know leisure and hospitality services and uh, yeah this was obviously the most affected area because this includes uh, transport this includes aviation industry this includes uh, boats uh, cruises all of this stuff that was unable to be accessed restaurants cafes everything that was completely uh, destroyed when it comes to the COVID times and stuff that is currently just starting to come back to its former levels so why I wanted to show you this well just simply because you can see 
um, the difference, for example, in March and April. In March, we saw very little movement in these, but in April, we actually saw a prolonged uh, you know, effect of the COVID pandemic on all of these industries and also a huge, huge amount of uh, shock when it comes to um, leisure and hospitality. So this, uh, for example, the growth rate for total private employment fell by almost 17% in April, about 10 times as much as it did in March. And as you can see, leisure and hospitality actually fell around 60% uh, at some point, which completely ruined the industry for a few years, which is why, uh, you know, the supply shock side was very big, but also the demand shock side was very big as well. So that's pretty much it for today's video. I wanted to do a little recap on Bitcoin's price action at this point. We are currently looking kind of bullish, right? Even though uh, the Fed, uh, did announce a drop in uh, oh, sorry not a, not a drop they all they announced another 75 basis points rate hike right just uh, last week and what that actually caused was a uh, you know it should have caused the movement in price that continues down but they did hint at a little bit of a you know calming down and easing of this policy which is probably why the market is taking a positive hint right now so i wouldn't call this a new bull run we still have a long time to go we still have some more information to take in from the market in the coming months but i'm going to keep you updated and if you enjoyed the video as always drop a like subscribe to the channel i'm not a financial advisor and you should do your own due diligence before investing into anything in the crypto blockchain or nft world and i guess i'll see you all in the next video